Welcome to the morning edition, the Monday morning edition, the 8 a.m. edition of Anglican Unscripted. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's Monday the 28th of October and actually it's lunchtime. Yeah, we pulled off something special this week. I'm in Connecticut. George is in Florida. Gavin is not in England. He's not at the castle in France. You're over in Greece somewhere. Where are you? Uh, I'm in Athens. I'm on the bay where um, where the uh, Persians landed as um, Marathon. The Battle of Marathon took place. So, so I'm I'm 21 and a half miles from Athens, which is the distance of the marathon. Uh, because this is where the guy ran from to say we, we've beaten them. And I'm at a, an ecumenical conference of Orthodox, Catholics, and Pentecostals, um, a couple of Anglicans, um, and they're called under, in, a, in a movement, a renewal movement called True Life in God. It's, it's really rather exciting. There's a high proportion of exorcists here, so it makes for, um, it, it makes <laughs> for a dra dramatic, dramatic pilgrimage. <laughs> well, before we get too far, I would need you guys to like the show. Uh, subscribe to the show. You're going to see this on Facebook. You're going to see this on YouTube. Somewhere in your view, there's a button you click that likes it. It's a little thumbs up thing. And that lets the algorithms at uh, Google, the algorithms at YouTube and Facebook know that this is something they need to promote a little bit more. If you're not getting updates and you want to subscribe to the program, you do that by going to the YouTube channel. You see that little red rectangle that says subscribe. You click on that. It gets you a subscription. If you want to know instantly when something new comes out, you click on that little notification button. If you're having trouble with notifications, there's a video link in the show description that tells you how to fix those because lo and behold, YouTube loves to change how they do things and they screwed it up this time royally but we can fix it. There's a, there's a way. Click that little link. On to the news. Um, there's a lot to talk about. Where were we last week? Well, Gavin was traveling. George was busy. I was busy. So I put up a uh, quick interview with David Old, and I uh, hope you get to watch that. Talks about what's going down in Australia. We're going to talk about what's going on in the Anglican Communion, but kind of the secular world in general. Uh, in our post or pre-show, we talked a little bit about the, the hopelessness that our youth have uh, now in our culture and how there's just no forgiveness built into the liberal mindset, the Marxist mindset. And I thought we could start talking about that because of uh, just some stories we've been reading. Um, you are reading a book, uh, Gavin, and you talked about just, just no forgiveness. Uh, bring us up to date. There, there are two authors who neither of whom are christians but 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 are both attracted to christianity and mm -hmm. they're promoting christianity as the antidote to the difficulties we're in one is tom holland uh, who wrote dominion the other is a man called douglas murray um douglas is gay he's um a gay intellectual he's written a book called the madness of crowds and he's particularly looking at the way in which um gender and the internet uh, have changed in the last 30 years and he he points out that we're now living in a world world where um, meanings and, and and values that people hold can change overnight. I mean, he gives the, the 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 rather pedestrian example of the way in which a number of politicians were against gay marriage, as everyone was four or five years ago. Hillary Clinton was is one of the examples he uses, and then Obama. says four or five. All of them, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Four or five years later, they 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 adopt it and will not allow anybody to be against it. Um, uh, he gives the examples of the way in which the internet has destroyed so many people's lives because of tweets that they carelessly wrote uh, in um, in 2008. And people say, well, there's been a collapse of context. I was writing this to a certain group of people with irony or with badinage or whatever, but um, the people trolling through our records pull up anything that we've written. And if it's against the present uh, system of values that people have, it's used against you and it could destroy your career. He gives the example of a racing driver who's, who's, um, whose father did said something slightly rude about, about Native Americans uh, uh, 10 years ago. And the son had an enormous lucrative sponsorship contract lined up as a racing driver and the company withdrew because of this, his father's remark. 
And what he suggests is that this, that the, the Cassandra the, or the Pandora's box that we've opened with the internet is creating a society in which there is no forgiveness and there's a there's a constant madness. Um, there is no sane, agreed, um, agreed system of values. And one of the reasons he says that the young are so anxious is because. Uh, values that you can hold in 2017 can suddenly be turned on their head and declared toxic and you could lose a job over them in 2025. Uh, so there's no certainty and there is no forgiveness above all. And it raises the, the very important question for us um, about the relationship of Christianity to the contemporary culture. So we, one of the things we'll discuss today is the extent to which Christianity has tried to adapt itself to a changing culture it doesn't understand in order to buy credits from people who don't really care about it, or the, to the contrary, the, the, those who have seen that what's coming upon us, both ideologically, culturally, and spiritually, is much more dangerous than ever we, 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 we guessed, and um, will require all the antidotes of the gospel and the gospel life, and perhaps the defense of catacomb living. When I went to school, college, long time ago, <clears throat> 1984, um, University of Wisconsin Madison had a couple parking garages. Uh, you could go drive your car all the way to the top, or if you were bored and looking for a reason not to study, you could walk to the top. And basically, you could look up over southern Madison without any trouble. And I was uh, up in Massachusetts the other day. Uh, which is just north of Connecticut. I'm driving by a new parking garage uh, that they're putting up at the University of Massachusetts. And it's five stories tall. And the biggest, most prominent feature is the big fence at the top that goes around it. Because they don't want kids who go to college there to jump off, to commit suicide. We have lost hope in our culture. And it's really become a selfie culture. It's become a culture where kids have no hope in their future, no hope in anything other than what they see in front of their hands and the device that they have. This is their, their communication, their, uh, their, the, the hope they get is from this little device because of whether people like something they said, like an image they put up, uh, whether they're going to be bullied today by their friends uh, through texting. Um, it's a completely different society than five years ago, 10 years ago, 50 years ago. The identification that we're giving our children of their value is coming from a little electronic rectangle the size of their hand. George, this can't continue much longer. I don't know if I, uh, if I necessarily agree with you. Um, yes, the internet culture, the selfie culture is toxic, but I think it's uneven. Um, I think when you have in post-Christian places, yes, in Massachusetts, they have to put a fence around the top of a uh, parking garage so the kids don't throw themselves out. If they had that in Gainesville at the University of Florida, they have to put the fence up so that fraternity students don't do stupid hazing rituals and fall off the top of the building. I, I think this collapse of purpose and meaning can be, you know, it's most profound in Western Europe and in portions of the North and the United States and in Canada and in the secularized West. It's not, it's the real, the, the, the faith, the absence of faith is a multiplier effect upon this culture that you're talking about, Kevin. And, What's difficult is you just can't say, okay, well then have faith and go to Sunday school and the kids will be just fine. Um, it, th you're pushing against the culture. So I, I guess I do sort of agree with you, but I don't think it's universally that bad. I think that where you have strong faith structures and strong familiar and cultural structures, um, these things uh, aren't as important. Well, like Gavin said, nobody believes in uh, forgiveness anymore. So you're bringing up your children in a society where they don't understand forgiveness and they know that any action they do when they're 13 or 14 or 15 lasts forever. It has a stigma with it that causes this uh, angst. But you the, know. yes and no. Yes, with it. Let's just take a recent example. Uh, John MacArthur, who's a very prominent reformed 
Baptist minister. He has a TV show. He's written dozens of books. He's, he's quite good at what he does. He's very conservative, doesn't believe in the ordination of women. He was on a panel discussion and was asked to give a one word or two word answer to questions about different issues. And Beth Moore, who's a very prominent woman pastor, where her name was raised and his response was go home. Uh, basically, he's saying that he doesn't like the idea of women pastors, and he has this whole biblical theology that he's laid out from, a, from the Reformed and the Baptist traditions. And all hell broke loose. Not, you know, some of it was within the church world, but most of it was within the non church world. How dare this man uh, attack the pieties? Now, Beth Moore herself, for, if you will, forgave and said, I understand where he's coming from. Folks, let's not beat him up. I disagree with him but he's my brother in Christ. So that the object of his derision, uh, the person whom he identified, was ready to forgive. But then you have places like Cokesbury Bookstores, which is the publishing house for the Methodist Church, and they also now run the Episcopal Church's publishing arm. Their response was to take all of MacArthur's books out of their catalog and off the shelves. The man's a Baptist. And he's a conservative Baptist who's been preaching the same thing for 30 years. And this Methodist bookstore chain decides that they're going to censor him because he's violated one of the PC uh, norms. And that, so within the Christian world, you know, you, there is forgiveness, there is give and take, there is disagreement. But it's when it's this, the, 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 the formerly Christian world, like the Methodist Church or the Episcopal Church, that there is no forgiveness. Um, well, that, that raises, it's like this John MacArthur business. That raises the question of what we mean by, by the Christian world and the former Christian world. I think I'd want to change, so I don't disagree with anything George has said, I, but, but I think it's more serious. Um, what we have is a, a culture that is stretching out its tentacles via the internet. Uh, across the world and indeed across time in terms of history being rewritten and the 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 the, the narratives being on the internet and, and one of the catholic theologians at the amazonian synod complained that somebody had been reaching into his wikipedia biography at the vatican inside the vatican and changing it <laughs> to uh, to make him look less appealing i think the problem that we have is that that, that whereas we used to have a Christian culture that was certainly set in opposition to a secular culture. Um, we only have secular culture now in the Western developed world. Again, George is quite right. Western developed culture hasn't spread across the whole planet yet, but everything is giving way before it really quite fast. And the problem with the internet is it's becoming ubiquitous and people are depending upon it increasingly. The, the, the difficulty with this new internet driven uh, Marxist based culture, by Marxist I mean utopian and egalitarian, is that it has no coherence within itself. So it, it doesn't agree about whether women are dressing for women or, or are dressing to be provocatively sexual for men. It doesn't agree, as Jordan Peterson says, on what the etiquette is in the office environment. Someone asked Peterson a year or so ago uh, how it was going in terms of the equality of women at work, and he said it's too early to know. We've only been doing this 40 years. Um, and he raised the whole question about whether women should wear makeup at work. If there's not supposed to be any uh, any any personal interrelationship at work, wouldn't it be more helpful if women didn't sexualize themselves in the workplace? And this this created an enormous problem in the interview because the secular society believes two opposite things at once. Women women uh, are not sexualized objects, but they're free to be sexualized objects, um, and only only. You know, only they get to choose which. The, so th again, the problem within trans within the gay culture is that uh, feminism has been completely uncut by the transgender issue. Uh, now, if a woman, a man, can choose to be a woman at any at any stage he wants to, feminism is dead. It, it doesn't exist anymore because um, there's no agreed definition of what a woman is apart from what you the construct the construction inside your head. So one of the problems, the things Murray is saying is that. We're not only dealing with a monolithic secular culture that is stretching everywhere and embedding itself through the internet, but it does, but it has internal con contradictions that drives itself mad, let alone everybody else. And so I think where I disagree with George is that the situation is becoming more intense and radical by, by the year. 
and 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 there isn't any way in which Christians can present an alternative Christian culture that matches the rhetoric of utopian egalitarianism. Your poor Baptist is never going to be published again. There aren't any Baptist publishers. He's going to, <laughs> uh, and, and so, uh, or whether 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 we withdraw in some way and and go under the radar and produce our own materials. Um, I don't mean to be nervously apocalyptic, but I, I think it's more serious than George has described, and I'm with Douglas Murray. We have, as Christians, we have to work out how we're going to deal with something that is quite so aggressive, uncompromising, and anti-Christian in every respect. So you're saying the three of us can't choose to be sexual objects on Anglican, unscripted, that's only reserved for female? Well, I am, I am saying that, that, that when people watch us on YouTube, um, we may already be breaking the terms and conditions of YouTube by having the conversation we've talked about. Oh, we absolutely. Yeah. We're not we violate YouTube all the time, but YouTube doesn't you know, uh, care about a, a small channel like us yet. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I, I agree with everything that Gavin has said, but I would, place my, but I would say that I, bl I believe that we're in a different part of the trajectory of wokeness, if you will, W-O-K-E, which is the now accepted word to describe this political correct worldview. Gavin says that we still have yet to peak. It's going to get worse before it gets better. I believe we're at peak wokeness right now, and I think it, I think it's about to crest um, because the my, my sense is that um, the ridiculousness is getting... We're at the point now where Stonewall, the uh, British uh, homosexual lobbying group is itself splitting because it is splitting over the transgender issue because lesbians are saying uh, it, when I was a young person and I was a tomboy and I was trying to explore my sexuality I was able to become a lesbian now I'm being told I must become a man to be f fully sexual be a full sexual being if I have these uh, impulses or instincts so the underlying premise of the transgender movement is actually completely at odds with the underlying premise of the homosexual rights movement gay rights movement and we're seeing these i believe we're we're, we're about to crest and we may have already crested and perhaps the election of ronald reagan and uh, bolisano in brazil and other places are all indicators that the masses are beginning to wake up to the corruption of their world by uh, the cultural elites. I, I, I don't There's know no way to say this is right or wrong, but I just have a sense that we are, we are very near the top of this wave, I believe. I, I don't know if George is right or wrong, or what, so I, you know, which, which of the two of us is, is correct. We, we won't know, of course. The thing that I think I, we would agree about is that I'm astonished it should take two um, secular atheist intellectuals to, to to look at Christian culture and its interaction with the present culture and to speak out on behalf of Christian values with an intellectual clarity and, uh, um, I don't like the word robust, it's overused, but a robust integrity, that no no group of bishops in Christendom appears to me to have done. I'm, I would think I would accept some of the Catholic bishops who seem to me to be willing to speak out in a muscular way for traditional Christian values. But outside that group, um, the, there is there is not a word to the silence, but I mean, you don't hear uh, the voices. We must have Christian intellectuals and theologians who are of the same caliber as Holland and Murray. But why is it that they have failed to see the stark, the, the stark, the virtues of Christianity and the dangers of secularism that these two men have so clearly written about in, in this last year? We don't seem to have a Christian voice challenging what's going on, apart, of course, from Anglican Unscripted. Well, I would I would argue, Gavin, that you're one of those voices that has emerged. Um, and, so and George I, I, and Kevin. I mean, we, but we have we, no. But but the other point that I was going to make is that within the church right now, theologians have absolutely no influence or standing. There's such a divide between the academy mm -hmm. and the actual church that they may as well be in different professions. In other words, a Christian intellectual who's in an academic setting has essentially no influence whatsoever on the working life of the vast majority of clergy and certainly 99 and 9 tenths of the people in the pews. Because it's so atomized and because it's so lost to its rootedness, 
be liberal or conservative, the seminaries are not places or the academy is not a place where reform and renewal is coming. It's coming in a, a vulgar and uncouth people like Donald Trump, or Balsano in Brazil, and play, people like that. It's coming in places that we've not expected it before, or it's coming from atheists or or uh, virtuous pagans like uh, Jordan Peterson. Yeah, well, I, I agree completely. I, I should have added Peterson to the Murray and to Murray and Holland. Well, that's interesting, of course, George, because you and I have grown up in a culture where we look to intellectuals, hoping that they had the tools of analysis to be able to do this. And it turns out quite rightly, as you say, the academy was an early victim to the whole egalitarian and, and, and um, restrictive culture that universities and this new Marxist movement has created, in which case we need to look for profits. I think we have to look amongst Christian, Christian, prophetic, Christian prophetic voices to stand up and to say, thus says the Lord. In one sense, any, any biblical Christian is prophetic, as they say, this is what scripture says. But the real danger is that Christians have been really demoralized by the sheer punch power of secular opprobrium. And it, and it takes enormous guts to stand up to it and probably, unfortunately, um, the capacity to, to endure secular consequences. If you, if you go into the public on, on the internet to say things about sexuality from a Christian point of view, there's a real danger you may damage your employment prospects, well, at the moment for the whole of your life. In fact, the only reason I'm provocative on my Facebook uh, postings about transgenderism and sexuality is I'm self-employed and my income is rather untouchable. Uh, I can be banned by Facebook, I can be banned by Twitter or YouTube, you know, that's, that's fine. But as far as, you know, my future and my family's future, we're okay because I have, you know, arranged my uh, income and future income to be untouchable uh, by society. However, if I were out looking for a job, I would be deleting my Facebook, I would be deleting my Twitter because there is no forgiveness of society. And I've said some things in the past where, well, I'm proud of everything I've said, but society would want to uh, guillotine me uh, for what I believe. Uh, there is just no forgiveness. I take a different approach. I think culture is going to get a lot worse. I think just from what we, we know from scripture, what we've seen uh, in the church uh, in its silence uh, the last 20 years, that culture has been given permission to attack Christians, to attack uh, Christian ideals, to uh, and Christianity is no longer pushing back. The Church of England is a perfect example. The bishops are not pushing back at any point against a European or English society. It's, it's quite the opposite. They're endorsing. They're endorsing society. They're, endorsing they're trying society. to. They're trying to smear a religious icing over over a corrupt anti-Christian mm -hmm. cake, which is one of the reasons why we don't hold back in criticism. I think one of the things I'd like to say is be more be, be more productive and positive. A few pastors have asked, "What do we do about Christian teaching?" I mean, if we want to expound some Paul from the pulpit, should we? And I think the answer is no. You shouldn't. Um, what you should do is expound the the creed from the pulpit, the, the the truth about the Word made incarnate, come to set people free from their sins, and for and, and that will provide you with uh, an, an intellectual pushback that sanctifies the human person, because God so loves the world he came, he sent his only son to save us from our sins. But uh, society hasn't yet learned to be edgy about that, uh, but it has learned to be, it, it's chosen sex and to, 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 to be the template of, all, of social secular orthodoxy. And I think therefore Christians should do what they did about the Eucharist with the catacombs, so that up to the third or the fourth century, anyone could come to worship. But the moment they, they, they introduced the Eucharistic part of the service, they would say, catechumens out. This is a mystery. And if you haven't been born again, you won't understand it. And we don't want you spreading rumors about our eating babies, which is one of the slanders that was put about by Christians as, as pagans worked out what they were doing with this sacrifice thing. Well, I think in the same way as the early church just decided it had to be secretive about the Eucharist because only the born again could know. So we may have to treat people, so we may have to deal with sexual ethics amongst amongst the, the Gnostics, amongst the Christian Gnostics, those who know, those who are born again, those who want to have their, their, their persons reformatted Christologically, but not to be silly enough to 
to to to provoke the hydra-headed censorious beast of secularism which has chosen sexuality as a battle to destroy all its opponents what a great place for a transition george talked a little bit about the uh the chaos going on inside the uh, southern baptist last week i as a interested reporter was watching the chaos going inside the uh, roman catholic church and the amazonian synod and I kind of want to talk about this as we close out the show. What on earth is going on? Have the liberals taken over the church? Uh, Inca gods are now a part of the Roman Catholic uh, uh, theos. Um, do we get to drown our icons? And uh, uh, it, it was just chaos. Uh, tell us a little bit what happened last couple of days in, in uh, the Amazonian Synod, George. The Amazonians said and concluded, I believe, on Saturday, um, with a whimper, not with a bang. Pope, that there was this whole uh, uh, furore over uh, fertility goddess idols, Pacamama, I believe, or Pacha Mama. I'm not certain of the pronunciation. I've only read it. Where these, uh, uh, they actually were. Uh, uh, bought in a market and they're curios. They're not actually ink native crafts. They were made in the Far East and shipped to Brazil. <laughs> but that's another story. Uh, that were set forward uh, representations of the Earth Mother Goddess and native spirituality and whatnot. And this caused a horrendous, horrendous uh, explo uh, response from the traditional Catholics who saw this as idolatry, whereas the liberal Catholics saw this as... Uh, uh, acknowledging the spirituality of oppressed and native peoples. And uh, Gavin made an excellent point that the kookiness that came out is a good thing because it was now put on display for all to see. Um, Erwin Krautler, who's a retired uh, Brazil, uh, German who was a bishop in Brazil, uh, was very proud to say that he had never baptized an Indian in his entire ministry. And I'm thinking, well, what's the point of his ministry if he's never baptized any of the people he's been sent to evangelize? Well, this, all of this has sort of now come out in the open. And the statues were placed inside of a church, and there were, uh, there were services where people would prostrate themselves before. And I actually recognized one of the Catholic bishops who was prostrating himself, and he's the former... Uh, uh, liaison officer between the Catholic Church and the Anglican Church. He's now a Canadian bishop from the prairie. But this guy, ah, oh, he is as woke as they come, and he is prostrating himself, kneeling or bowing his head to these idols. Well, they were stolen, tossed into the Tiber. The Carbonari re recovered them. They were put back inside the church, and Francis apologized for the theft and said, we may even have them in the final service in St. Peter's. Well... They weren't in the final service at St. Peter's. So we ended it with a whimper. We hope didn't go through with that. But the the end result has been an absolute boon for Pentecostals and evangelicals in South and Central America. Because now they can say, see, we've told you all along that Catholics are pagans and idolaters. Here they're doing it up front. And this is probably the best thing for Catholic Church went from 90% of the Brazilian population to now less than 50%. Um, this, there have been two generations now of, of Catholic leaders in Brazil especially, and in other parts of South America, who have, in essence, eviscerated the whole Catholic Church and its teachings, doctrines, ideology. And these are the people who ran the, the Amazon Synod, and now they want to bring this uh, worldview perspective of Catholicism to the wider church, and they're going to ask Francis to affirm the things that they've come up with. Women deacons, married priests. Um, one thing they've said is that Paul VI made an order when he abolished minor orders of exorcist and whatnot. Uh, he, he kept uh, acolyte and lector, but according to the official canon law, those must be men. Well, and that's widely ignored in places like the United States where you have girl acolytes and everything, but still the canon law is that they must be men. Now they're saying, let's abandon those and allow women to be acolyte and lectors. Let's allow women to be or deacons. And basically what they're doing is by, in essence, cutting out from minor orders 
the relationship, the, the the sort of relationship between uh, maleness. Gavin is a better exponent on these issues, but basically, they're opening the door so that at the end of the day, why can't we have women priests? Because the arguments that you're raising now weren't raised over these other issues of deacons and acolytes and lectors and all this ontological stuff that you're talking about. We said it didn't matter, but they're still ordained ministers. If, so if the I, door's been open for the if, the door's been open for a clever liberal to to drive home <coughs> the desire for some for women Catholic priests. So, so George, that's great, but very helpful. I'd like to add to it by saying that I think the key to it all lies within the Old Testament. Um, the, the children of Israel were given an experience of the holiness of God. And this holiness divides the world between between what is reconciled in holiness and what can't be reconciled. And so through blood sacrifice and the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, the people of God are those who've been reconciled. And one of the reasons why, why women priests is so important is because masculine and femin femininity have, have split a lot along, the, uh, along this divide in the sense that not that male is holy and woman is unholy at all, but the search for the life force is associated with the feminine and, this, and the search for holiness is associated with God as father. And whatever, we, whatever our instinctive um, uh, theological preferences, the, this the earth, sky, father, earth, mother um, tension has been, has been around forever. And so what you have in the Catholic Church is the struggle that's going on between Christians everywhere, all over the world, including with orthodoxy, between enculturation and conversion. That is, if you believe in holiness, you know that people have to be saved and converted. If you don't believe in holiness, you want to dig into the to the traditions of, of wisdom and and uh, and culture and see if you can find the divine in it. Um, and so that's what the Catholic Church has been struggling with. Does it respect the divine in the imminence and in the feminine and in fertility? Or does it accept the holiness of God as it's mediated through God the Father and his son Jesus Christ? They're all the feminine and the feminine imagery is of course the church and Mary. And if you don't have a proper feminine theology of the church and you, and you don't have anything to do with Mary who gave Jesus his body, well then of course it's really quite difficult to find a balance between the two as the church has to. I agree with George that, that it's a very good thing in terms of in Christian terms that the septicemia that is uh, brought to the surface so people could see what it is. I just loved that video on YouTube where these two traditional Catholics broke into the church at five o'clock in the morning, took Pakamama out, placed her on a bridge and swept her into the Tiber. <laughs> it was one of my marvelous moment. Uh, and I'm very, yeah, well, glad, yeah. I'm very yeah. glad that the Pope was too frightened to reintroduce uh, these Amazon-delivered Far Eastern pseudo-artifacts uh, to the last rite of the Synod. But we need to remember the Catholics are dealing with the same issue that we are theologically and spiritually, and I think stand together in, in, in order to preserve um, incarnation, revelation, and holiness. One thing I want to stress is that you have, at this point, an extraordinary split, if you will, if, you, if you're an, a Catholic apologist, you've got a difficult job right now. Cardinal Gerhard Muller, who's the former president of the congregation CDF, the holy office, if you will, the office that sets and maintains and this is what we believe, said that these uh, Pacamama uh, uh, statues were idolatry and bringing them into church was a violation of divine law. Here you have the former head of the CDF saying that this was a heretical, scandalous act uh, to have these in Christian worship. Then you have Pope Francis apologizing for their uh, being stolen and countenancing their, their use in Christian worship. And you have bishops and religious and other people dressed up in feathers prostrating themselves and issuing offering words of incantations in front of them, which is Catholicism. Well, well, it, it, well, for the for the Brazilian Pentecostal, mm -hmm. of course, Catholicism are these kooks. 
that's a very important question, George, and one that all of us have to struggle with. And the Catholic answer is, so long as you preserve the office, God can renew the church. But if you break the office or you break apostolic continuity, then you've created something idolatrous in your own image and makes it much harder for God to renew. That's why so many of us have said over the consecration of women to episcopacy that you've broken the apostolic order and it's going to be very hard for God to reorganize, uh, to renew the church in, ter in, 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 in theological terms that are true to revelation. The Catholics would say, we've had bad popes, we've had bad cardinals. Do you know what? Time and the devil swept them both away. But keep the, off keep the church is keep the church's apostolic structure in the right place and you allow the Holy Spirit to bring renewal as he has done. I mean, you know, you can name a, a movement of the spiritual and renewal every single century in the Western church, whether you go for, for, for the Desert Fathers or for Dominic or for Francis or for the women mystics of the Middle Ages. The Spirit has always renewed the church, but you mustn't change the, struct, the apostolic structure of the church uh, out, out, of, out of recognition. We should also mention uh, in for for future strategy, if you're going to steal these little pakamamis, don't throw them in the river, burn them. Think Sodom and Gomorrah. They cannot be reused if they've been incinerated. Um, that's what God used to do in the Old Testament. It may work nowadays. Gentlemen, we've had a wonderful morning discussion of uh, all things Anglican and and cultural and chaotic. Um, please understand in the Christian understanding, forgiveness is not only a theological term, it is a practice and it's the only way in your f uh, future relationship and current relationship with the Father. I wanna thank you guys for watching the show. Please like us, subscribe to us, you know what to do. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashton, and you've been listening to episode 546 of Anglican Unscripted, and I'm saying this from Marathon, where a man ran 22 miles to shout victory, and we shout victory not for the armies of Greece, but for the Lord Jesus Christ over sin and death. <laughs>